Welcome to St. Mark's Online, everyone. Super excited to have you here with us this morning. If you're a guest, we invite you to text SM Guest to 94000. Please worship with us. Thank you. 
the heart to our content And all who feel unworthy All who hurt with nothing left Would know that you are holy And all Go on and scream it from the mountains Go on and tell it to the masses That he is God God, I pray that every day we can shout it. Every day you give us the confidence to claim it to the masses. You are God. You are good. And I pray as we're entering into this fall season that you give us the confidence to make the correct decisions. You give us the confidence we need to move on. I pray that you give us the confidence every day to scream from the top of the mountains that you are God, that Jesus is Lord, 
And it's in his name that we pray these things to you today. Amen. Culture is constantly shifting around us. And there are so many voices that are trying to mold and shape us into something we are not. We put on mask after mask after mask, attempting to fit in all while shutting out who we were created to be. How do we define ourselves in a culture that defies definition? How do we stand strong in who God has created us to be while loving people well? How do we take back our true identity? Hey everybody, welcome to St. Mark's. I'm Pastor Paul. Thanks for joining us this morning online. We have a special guest preacher today, the last of our five micro MDiv students, Phyllis Hubler. We've saved the best for last. You're going to love the word of God that she brings to you today. Give her your full attention and welcome Phyllis today. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Good morning. Our Identity Shift series continues today as we consider the topic of ministry. I am the oldest member of the Micro MDiv group at St. Mark's. In 2014, I retired after 28 years in healthcare. After retiring, I made perennial flower beds all around the corners of the yard and in any open areas that I could claim as flower plots. About the same time that I was running out of choice flower plots, plots our um, mission team to Anamosa State Penitentiary for Men started here at St. Mark's, and I joined that mission group to the, the penitentiary. Many times at the penitentiary, I felt ill-equipped um, to know what best to say to the gentlemen currently residing there when they brought up questions about interpretation of a scriptural passage that was different than the interpretation that I was used to hearing it uh, as, or expressed a different slant on a theological is issue. When this seminary opportunity presented itself through St. Mark's, I was assured that the 18 month of courses was perfect for anyone interested in going deeper into church service. I was all in. That is until I found out about Google Docs and all of the papers with bibliographies that we would be writing monthly, sometimes twice a month <laughs> for 18 months. Now, as a physical therapist, I initially wrote out my documentation for the medical record longhand, and then later we were progressed to where we could dictate it into a phone. It wasn't until toward the end of my career that I started carrying around a laptop from visit to visit. My employer gave me a little card with step-by-step -step instructions so that I could accurately get the documentation into the medical record in the right place and in a timely fashion. Now, I'm doubting that the younger generation can identify with needing a listed agenda for getting documentation into a computer, but for me in my 60s, it was absolutely necessary. It wasn't long after joining the um, seminary studies that my cohort group recognized that computer skills were a bit intimidating to me. And um, they ended up giving me a template so that I could use that to get the documents, uh, the the papers that we were writing into the computer the way they were expected to be turned in. Um, that really meant a lot to me. They also would troubleshoot when my computer just wouldn't work right. In fact, this happened quite regularly, especially in the beginning. So it took a lot of help that I can stand here today to talk to you about our sermon topic, ministry specifically God's calling to ministry. There are three points that I want to make regarding this. What are the qualifications for calling? How is one equipped? And how is the call to be answered? 
Let's explore today's scripture located in the New Testament letter to the Ephesian church written by Paul, the Apostle. If you have a Bible or a Bible app, I will be reading Ephesians 3, 7 to 12 from the English Standard Version called the ESV for short. In it, Paul writes, Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Jesus Christ our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Earlier in the letter, Paul had already uh, address the deep division that had existed between the Jew and the Gentile. In that time, the Jews considered anyone that was not of Jewish origin to be a Gentile. And there was quite a division in terms of how the Jews and Gentiles viewed each other, since Gentiles often worshipped other gods. In our selected passage, Paul tells them in verse 7 that he has been selected to be a minister by God. The word translated as minister is diakonos. This is the same word that was used to derive the word that we use today, deacon. And you've probably heard that in association with some other um, denominations. This word is translated as servant in the NIV and the NLT uh, Bibles. It describes a person serving or attending one of greater authority. Paul then explains in verse 8 that he has been given the ministry of sharing the gospel with the Gentiles. This calling of the people to be servants is a major thing theme throughout the New Testament by Jesus and by the early church fathers. It implies a voluntary attitude of service to God and to his created order. It is not a demand. It is not a requirement for church membership or a requirement for salvation. It is a commissioning of the church family for God's purposes. It is an expectation of God our Father that we would all respond to this gift of grace. In verse 7, Paul says, I was made a minister or servant according to the gift of God's grace. Likewise, as believers, we are all recipients of God's grace through faith. Thus, we are all care called. Grace, if you're unfamiliar with that term in the biblical sense, is unmerited favor. In the book Reconciling All Things, authors Catton Goley and Rice tell the true story of Billy Neal Moore. In 1974, Moore, an army soldier home on leave in Georgia, tried to rob 77-year-old Fred Stapton in his home. When Stapton heard an intruder, he shot into the darkness. Moore shot back and killed him. Moore admitted his guilt and was sentenced to death. While he was in jail, a minister visited him and told him about how much Jesus loves him, that Jesus would like him to repent of what he had done and that Jesus would forgive him. Mr. Moore learned then that no one is beyond redemption. He wrote a letter to his victim's family, telling them that he was now a Christian and asking for their forgiveness before his death. They were also Christians, 
and forgave him, even going so far as to petition the Georgia Parole Board to commute his death sentence. In 1991, Moore was released from prison, embraced by his victim's family, and by the grace of God and by this Christian family's deeds, has been preaching the gospel of forgiveness to school children and church groups since. Yes, grace is unmerited favor. As forgiven sinners, we are all recipients of God's grace. Returning to Paul, what qualifications did Paul have for his calling? Paul, also known as Saul, was a persecutor of the early Christian church. He was a Pharisee, a well-educated Jew in both written and oral Old Testament law and tradition, and a watchdog for conformity among practicing Jews to the rigorous keeping of the laws of the Jewish faith. He is mentioned in Acts 7 as being present when Stephen, the first Christian martyr, was stoned to death. In verse 8 of our scripture for today, Paul writes that he is the very least of all the saints. After all, it was when Paul was on the road to Damascus with the intent to find and imprison more Christians that he was struck down, blinded, and given a divine revelation by the ascended Jesus. Why would he now be called to share the gospel with the Gentiles? People not considered chosen by God to the Jews because God extended his grace, his unmerited favor to Paul. This is not unusual behavior for our God. He often chooses the weak and the least likely candidates to do his work. Remember the men called by Jesus to be his disciples? Fishermen, a tax collector, even Martha and Lazarus's sister, Mary, sat as would a disciple at his feet. At that time in history, women did not see, sit at the feet of the rabbi. Consider the apostle Peter, the rock, denying Christ three times the night of Jesus' interrogation in Jerusalem before he was crucified. Peter flatly denied he would ever deny Jesus, and yet did just that three times. After his resurrection, Jesus came to his disciples. He sought them out, extended forgiveness, and called them to action. As with Peter and Paul, God calls us, not because of our qualifications, but because of his grace. Since Paul was not qualified, how was he equipped for his ministry? In Acts 9, we learn that Jesus also spoke to Ananias in a dream about the same time he appeared um, to Paul on the road to Damascus. Ananias was a follower of Jesus living in Damascus. Ananias visited him three days later Paul had been helped into town by his traveling companions after being blinded, so he had been in town for three days. Ananias, as you can imagine, was not excited about God's message to go visit Paul, knowing of his past violence toward Christians. But Ananias was obedient to God. He went to Paul, healed him, and baptized him, and then he taught him further. Paul began his ministry amongst the synagogues and moved from Damascus to Jerusalem to reconcile with and partner with the Christians in, the, in that town. Paul's service developed as he lived, learned, and worked in community with other Christians, becoming a great apostle and the writer of over half the New Testament that we use today for our scriptures. God recognized Paul's capacity to make a difference for good 
in the very church he previously rejected and persecuted. Like Paul, we are called when we come to faith. Regardless of our past or our personal gifts or strengths, Paul and all believers are equipped through the work of the Holy Spirit, through Christian community, through prayer, through reading God's word, and through past and current life experiences. Paul could use his education, his understanding of the law and Jewish traditions, and his newly acquired wisdom and understanding from the Holy Spirit to help him in his ministry. The many people that he met, discipled, and ministered to, they helped him too, giving support and encouragement during his long and difficult missional travels and during his times in prison. We too will never serve alone. The Holy Spirit abides in us, counseling and interceding for us. God provides the community of the church, family, prayer warriors, and mentors. And when we have self-doubt, like I did, in prison ministry, he offers opportunities for learning. It has been said before that God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. Let us take a moment now to consider what Paul tells us about how he ministered and served God. The ESV, verse 11b to 12, says, In Jesus Christ we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. It uses the word boldness, that in Jesus we have boldness and access with confidence because of our faith in him, not because of our faith in ourselves, but because of our faith in him. The word translated boldness here may, means open, frank, and without concealment in the public sphere. We as Christians then are not afraid to demonstrate that we are Christian in word and deed. God doesn't demand that we speak only Christianese, but we aren't afraid to enjoy and go to Christian movies, meet our friends at school at the flagpole, invite someone to our church, forgive those that hurt us, and to love those that are different in thought and or looks than we are. We love God by loving others well, with the love that Jesus modeled for us when he walked this earth. The word translated as boldness in the ESV is the same word used in Acts 4.13 to describe Peter and John testifying before the council in Jerusalem after receiving the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. They had healed a man unable to walk. Listeners at the council were amazed that such uneducated common men could appear so bold before them and remembered that they had been with Jesus. When I began to speak to you today, I told you that I didn't consider computer skills to be a strength of mine. Well, I don't consider public speaking to be one either, but God has presented me with this opportunity to stand before you today and share scripture and witness to the transforming power of God in my life. It is this power that enables me to boldly declare that over the course of my faith journey, God has changed me from a child seeking to be fed by my church to a disciple longing to serve in Jesus' name. We are all called, we are all equipped we can all be bold and confident in God's promises of faithfulness and forgiveness. The needs of this world are great. God created us with the plan to redeem us through the remarkable gift of the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. In response to God's gifts, we thrill to love our Father well through loving and serving others. 
What is God calling you to do today? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for always being available to us, for dwelling in us and shaping us as we better understand who we have become through your redeeming love. We want to embrace our true identity as sons and daughters called and equipped for service, confident that we can be used in your kingdom on earth to share our love with others, your wisdom and your recess sources. Thank you for always equipping those you send. We ask for discernment, that we would see where you were at work around us, that we might join you there. In Jesus' name, amen. Clear the stage, set the sound, the lights ablaze. That's the measure you must take to crush the idols. Jerk the pews, all the decorations too, until the congregation's few and have revival. Tell your friends this is where the party ends. Until you're broken for your sin, you can't be social. Seek the Lord and pray for what he has in store. Great is your reward, so just be hopeful. You can sing all you want to. You can sing all you want to. You can sing all you want to and still get it wrong. Worship is more than the stage, set the sound.
down and light to blaze If that's the measure you must take To crush the idol 